Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku's innocence is questioned by Katsuki part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Extras mingled about the school entrance like drooling. Knuckle dragging chimpanzees, gawking up at the green haired silhouette standing at the roof's edge. Katsuki watched from further away and glowered at the backs of everyone's heads. Don't do it. One kid called up jokingly. You have so much to live for. Do a flip. Another urged. Katsuki sneered at them. They pointed and shouted without a care in the world, blind to the danger that thing posed to them all. Machines ran their cars, their microwaves, their hospitals, tricking humans into relying on them. It was only a matter of time before they pulled the plug and watched as everyone drowned in their own stupidity. Katsuki growled, popped some nitroglycerin in his hands, and vowed he would never let it happen. He would become the number one hero and expose Deku for what he really was. A teacher, noticing that the students hadn't scurried off like startled rats, stepped outside and saw the cause of the commotion. Midoriya, please come down. It's not safe up there. Understood, Deku called back. Deku jumped. Katsuki snickered as the teacher scrambled out of the way. Phones waved about as each student jockeyed for the best view of their falling classmate. With a thunderous crack and the screech of warped metal, Deku hit the ground in a kneeling pose. Concrete cracked and buckled in a circle around him. The useless extra zooted and awed as Deku stood and dusted himself off. The knee he had landed on refused to straighten all the way. Noticing this, the teacher rushed over and said, Oh God, Midoriya, would you like me to drive you to the hospital? No need, Deku said. This will be simple to repair. As Deku sat down and pulled back his jeans, Kastuki shouldered his way past the extras. A blade protruded from Deku's finger. He slid it through his skin and peeled it back. Underneath, coils of wires wound around gleaming steel beams. His kneecap, warped into a knot, glistened with a layer of oil. A clear membrane held back bright red fluid, a pale imitation of blood. See, Katsuki shouted. Nothing but metal and wires inside. Duh, it's his quirk. It's not a quirk. That's the lie made up to trick you all into thinking it's human. Shut up already, I want to see this. A beam of plasma from another finger seared through the twisted metal like butter. Deku pulled out the lump, popped it in his mouth, swallowed, and welded his leg shut. Moments later, Deku tested his new knee. As everyone crowded around, asking Deku a million questions about his quirk, the teacher reminded them all that class was over and made them disperse. Bakugo sullenly looked back at Deku as the teacher fussed over his formerly broken leg and vowed that, one day, he would make them all see the truth. One day, they would all realize that Deku was a robot. Tashinori grumbled to himself as his buff form vanished in a cloud of steam. The slime villain had slipped through his fingers. Scrawny as he was, Tashinori could still use a phone, and he had a rough idea where to look. The deafening booms led him to his target. The viscous ball of slime with eyes had a teenager in its clutches. The kid flung explosions everywhere as the villain forced itself into his mouth. The heroes on the scene stayed back and managed the crowd. Kamui Woods would light up like kindling. Mount Lady wouldn't fit in a cramped alleyway, and Backdraft had raging fires to keep under control. Tashinori turned away, with a prayer that a more suitable hero would arrive soon. Shouts from the crowd made him look back. Another kid marched past Death Arm's barricade, ignoring the hero's shouts to stay out. The slime villain laughed as the kid walked up to him and punched his gelatinous body. When the kid realized that his punches did nothing to the villain and scraping slime off the victim's mouth only gave a second's reprieve, he stepped back. Tashinori thought he was giving up, but instead, the kid scooped a handful of slime into his mouth. The crowd went deathly silent. The villain gawked at him. Even the victim stopped struggling to give the crazy kid a wide-eyed stare. You know what? The villain said. Fine. If you want to taste that badly, have some more. The villain threw his first victim aside and plunged into the other kid's mouth. Within seconds, the villain had fit himself inside. Tashinori pushed his way to the front of the crowd, stomach clenching with fear, but the kid seemed undisturbed by the villain currently residing in his stomach. Death Arms approached the kid cautiously. Ah, uh, you alright kid? The kid blinked at him. Yes I am, thank you for asking. Death Arms held out a thermos. Any chance you could spit out that villain? Tilting his head, the kid said, I'm not physically capable of spitting out anything I swallow. I am only able to digest it. Huh? The villain's muffled voice echoed out of the kid's mouth. I'm immune to stomach acid. I don't have stomach acid. It would melt through my body. Moments later, the villain screamed and bubbled out, shrieking, fire. Why are you filled with fire, you crazy kid? Death Arm scooped the steaming villain into the thermos and screwed the lid shut. As the hero congratulated the kid, Tashinori smiled to himself. The kid had charged into danger and put himself at risk to save another. 
He had his successor, one already strong enough to handle his quirk. As Tashinori followed the kid away from the crowd, he grinned at the thought of rubbing his new successor in Nainai's face. That would show him he wasn't an idiot. One conversation later, Izuku ate a golden hair, and the quirk it carried vanished in a puff of smoke. Tashinori felt his head spinning as he drove up to Dagaba Beach. Izuku had grown two inches and some serious biceps overnight. His mother knew about one for all and his wound, and worst of all, he had no idea how to teach his new protege. The thought of teaching at Yua in the spring sent a shiver down his spine. Heaps of trash dotted the sand, and nobody walked within reach of the beach's stench. It made the perfect spot to let Izuku unleash one for all. All right, Tashinori said as he held his nose. Try punching that refrigerator over there as hard as you can. Izuku punched, metal squealed, and the refrigerator soared halfway across the beach. So much for teaching him how to activate his new quirk. Tashinori smiled, thinking that teaching might be easier than he had thought. Nice punch. Doesn't look like we'll have to work on your strength, so let's work on building your character. We're going to clear all the trash on this beach. Understood. Izuku looked around. He walked up to a rusted car missing its front hood and three tires. His fingers sprouted serrated claws that gouged a chunk out of the side. Unhinging his jaw, Izuku shoved the entire piece down his throat. Tashinori watched in silent fascination as Izuku ate the entire car. The skin on Izuku's back split apart. A giant shaft, sporting long, spindly arms and thick, stumpy legs, grew behind him. As Izuku walked forward, the new appendages snapped more trash around him and shoved it into his back. Black smoke billowed out Izuku's mouth as plastic and wood burned inside him. The metallic growth behind him grew longer, branched off, and sprouted more arms to gobble up trash. Bits and pieces fell off it as he moved, which the arms scooped up and consumed again. The smoke drew a crowd. People watched and took pictures as Izuku dug through mountains of trash. Within minutes, the police arrived, and Tashinori flashed his agency's card to keep them from hauling Izuku away. News reporters arrived shortly after, and Tashinori put on his best TV face as he spouted off about training the future's heroes. By the time he finished with the interview, Izuku had cleared the beach. All Might gawked at the shambling monstrosity, the size of a city block, that trailed after him. All done. Where should I put this? Izuku asked. Tashinori pointed at the pickup truck they had driven in. I only brought that to take away the trash. Understood. The appendages curled up on themselves like a giant roly-poly. When Izuku rolled it into the truck's bed, both bumpers hit pavement and the tires flew off the axles. Izuku shifted the weight around until the entire mass rested on the flattened truck and asked, What next? Tashinori told himself Izuku just misunderstood him as he changed into his hero costume. Having banked on the beach cleanup lasting a few months, Tashinori scrambled for other training methods. He settled for the tried and true method of wandering aimlessly and hoping to come up with a good idea somewhere. At a busy intersection, he found inspiration in the old woman waiting patiently for a crossing signal. All right, Midoriya, this will be a nice, simple warm-up. See that old lady there. Help her cross the street. Instructions confirmed. Izuku hoisted the elderly woman onto his shoulders. Tashinori cringed at the rough handling, but the woman only seemed intrigued by her new vantage point. While traffic still passed through the intersection, Izuku ran towards the crosswalk and cleared the street in one leap. Concrete buckled beneath the force of his landing, and other pedestrians scrambled out of the way. The woman whooped with delight. Pointing across another street, she shouted, that way. Before Tashinori could stop him, Izuku leapt across the other street. Tashinori ran after him, but with only half a lung to work with, he could only watch as Izuku shrank into a green speck down the street. One police car raced by him, sirens blaring, then another. A whole squad of cars barreled down the road after Izuku, and a horde of news vans trailed after them. When Tashinori finally caught up, he found a blockade set up around Izuku. Half a dozen news teams had cameras trained on Izuku. Put down the old lady and keep your hands in the air. One officer shouted through a megaphone. Izuku tried getting the woman off his shoulders, but between the fact she clung to him and he couldn't lower his hands, he soon abandoned the effort. Unable to comply, Izuku told the officer, You'll never take me alive. The elderly woman shouted, as she happened to be a voice actor for multiple shonen protagonists. The officers mistook her voice for Izuku's and trained pistols on him. He's resisting arrest. Take him down. Panicking, Tashinori buffed up mid-stride and raced in front of the officers. After a long conversation with Tsukachi over the phone, he managed to talk the officers out of arresting Izuku. The old woman grinned ear to ear as she stepped off Izuku's shoulders. My, I haven't felt that alive since my husband ran off with some skank. If only I was 50 years younger. Izuku looked her up and down. Indeed, you are alive. Have a nice day. 
As they looked for the next place Izuku could practice being a hero, Tashinori pointedly ignored the cracked sidewalks in their wake and told himself that Izuku just needed some time to adjust to his new quirk. A little girl sobbed quietly and clutched a teddy bear while her cat stared down at her from a tree branch. All Might, recognizing another basic hero scenario, comforted the little girl and mentally prepared himself for another test of Izuku's heroism. We need to get that cat down from the tree, All Might told Izuku. Do not damage the tree, or the cat, or any bystanders, or the street, adjacent buildings, or anything else in the near vicinity. Do not make any noises exceeding 80 decibels or lights bright enough to blind someone. Do not commandeer a military drone, hack into the nearby traffic lights, or eat any power cables. Understand? Izuku nodded. He stared up at the cat for a solid five minutes. All Might felt sweat pouring down his face as he waited for disaster to strike. A delivery man, grunting and sweaty under an overstuffed backpack, ran up to Izuku and asked, Are you the one that ordered 50 tuna salad sandwiches? Izuku took the sandwiches, scooped the tuna out of one of them, and shoveled the rest, still wrapped in paper, into his mouth. Tuna in hand, Izuku extended his arm until he could reach the cat. Smelling the tuna, the cat latched onto his arm and scarfed down the treat while Izuku retracted his arm. Cat acquired, Izuku told All Might. How did I do? All Might glanced around the street, expecting to find crumbling infrastructure and squads of police cars. Everyone had vanished, but everything else looked normal. A relieved sigh left him. Perfect, Midoriya. You did a fine job. At this rate, you'll be ready for the entrance exam in no time. The little girl squealed with joy and gave the cat a crushing hug, much to the cat's displeasure. All Might congratulated himself on a job well done and led Izuku to the next random lesson that caught his eye. In a nearby alleyway, a police officer spoke into his radio. All units, abort. Midoriya has left the scene without any collateral damage. False alarm. Further down the alley, 12 squad cars, a SWAT team, 2 tanks, 4 police helicopters, 3 K-9 squads, a sniper team, 3 ambulances, 2 fire trucks, multiple constructions crews, 5 insurance agents, and every local news van within 10 miles all filed out of the alleyway with disappointed grumbling. Katsuki glowered at the extras around him as he filed into his seat. While he ruminated about how he would crush them all under his feet, show the masses the might of his quirk, and unite them all against the robot menace, Deku plopped into the seat next to him. The seat groaned under its weight. Robots can't be heroes, Deku, Katsuki snarled. I'm not a robot. Oh yeah, Katsuki took in its taller and sturdier frame. Let me guess, you got another one of those overnight growth spurts? It's a part of my quirk. More like an upgrade, Katsuki sneered. Hey, a bespectacled student called down. Please keep it down, you are disturbing everyone else's concentration. Can it? Four eyes. Deku peered up at him and asked, Aren't you also disturbing everyone's concentration? The extra's eyes widened, and he kowtowed to everyone around him. He is absolutely right. You all have my deepest apologies. Katsuki hissed at Deku, I know what you're planning, robot. I'm watching you. Deku blinked at him and asked, How do you know I'm going to replace All Might? As that bombshell went off in Katsuki's head, present Mike came up to the podium and shouted, Hey there, listeners, can I get a big hey? Silence filled the auditorium. A buzzing noise came from Deku's chest, and a 3D printed metallic ya popped out its mouth. The robot held it up and asked, Is this what you asked for? Present Mike chuckled weakly and said, Not quite the volume I wanted, but very nice. I see, I could make more, but it would weaken the integrity of my chassis. No, I don't need any of them. Oh, okay. Izuku chewed up the word with deafening crunches and swallowed. All right, present Mike said awkwardly, for those of you that didn't take a pamphlet, here's how this will work. We'll start with the entrance exam, which I hope you all studied for. After that is the practical exam, where you'll fight robots until time runs out. A manic grin spread across Katsuki's face. He leapt out of his seat and shouted, fuck yeah, those robots won't know what fucking hit them. Language, four eyes roared, and how dare you interrupt a teacher. So manly, an extra with spiky red hair said, staring at him in awe. He stood and said, what he said. Those robots are going down. As the auditorium devolved into chaos, present Mike sighed and shouted loud enough to shatter windows five blocks away. Once the examinees fell into a stunned silence, tiny drones handed out the exams. Katsuki glared at the robot that plopped an exam next to him, certain that it had sabotaged his test. The thought of taking Deku's crossed his mind. But then he realized that the robots wanted him to steal a test and sabotage Deku's instead. Smugly certain he would outsmart them, Katsuki put pen to paper. To his irritation and everyone else's amazement, Deku finished in 30 seconds. Start. Present Mike shouted. Everyone stared at him in confusion until the sound of footsteps caught their attention. Like a flock of birds, the sound of one taking off had them all running. Ada fired up his engines and sprinted deep into the city, thinking to find more robots the deeper he went. Every robot he passed had its head caved in. 
further along. The robot showed no signs of damage, but they remained unmoving all the same. I think there has to be some kind of mistake, Ada shouted, hoping someone would hear. These robots hadn't been turned on. That's where you're wrong, little listener. As Ashi called from half a mile away, another examinee turned those off. Better hurry if you want some points. Inwardly panicking, Ada sprinted to the far edge of the city, where he saw Izuku backflip over a robot and hit the switch on its head. Izuku looked around and said, All targets neutralized. Awaiting further orders, Ada felt his heart drop. All his practice and training, spurning his brother's offer of a recommendation, all made meaningless by a single student in a couple of minutes. There has to be something I can do, Ida muttered weakly. As if in answer to his prayers, the ground shuddered, concrete split open, and buildings fell aside as a mechanical behemoth lumbered towards the milling students. Ada backpedaled and said, That's the zero pointer. We should get out of here. Izuku didn't move. He stared inquisitively at the giant robot and said, There's someone trapped in front of it. Ada froze mid-step, peering at the rubble. He could just make out a cream-colored blob amidst gray chunks. She'll be fine. This is just a test, after all. The robot raised its foot. Izuku pointed his right hand at the behemoth. His wrist ballooned outward, while the fingers shrank into the opening. A green sphere pulsated inside the hollow barrel. With a high-pitched whine, emerald light burst from the cannon and slammed into the robot. White-hot metal gushed down its back. The zero-pointer shuddered, its lights flickering, and toppled backwards with a deafening crash. Ada gawked at the fallen robot. That was incredible. Truly, I am not deserving of being here if these are the standard students at you are held to. As the dust settled, Nezu spoke through an intercom. He sounded manic, and the occasional giggle punctuated his voice. I have bad news and good news. Bad news. Three students destroyed all the robots. Well, except in Area C, but no one cares. Good news. We have plenty of experimental models to test. Yes, test. Test to your heart's content. Test after test after test. We'll have so much fun. The rodent's maniacal laughter echoed across the empty buildings. The ground shuddered, the Imperial March played, and battle droids straight out of a Star Wars movie marched out of underground bunkers. As Eater ran for cover from blaster fire, he shouted, This wasn't on the pamphlet. Power Loader gawked as his prized zero-pointer got a new thermal exhaust port seared through its chest. That color, he said, boric acid. Inko always added it to whatever plasma emissions she made for that striking green color. She called it her signature. Majima snorted. A waste of boron if you ask me. A student brought in an outside weapon. Aizawa asked. That student is the outside weapon. Some techno quirk merging mechanical components. Figures she had a kid like that. Majima scowled down at the student standing amidst his fallen robots. And Ko thinks she can still mock me, does she? Well, I'll show her. As he went to turn on more robots, Aizawa stopped him with a band of capture scarf. You're not activating more robots. But why not? They already destroyed them all. Clearly we need to amp up the exam. As much as I am inclined to agree, Nezu said, that wouldn't be fair to the other examinees. Majima had a crazed grin on his face. Come on, Nezu. Don't you want to? Test them out. Every teacher in the room flinched at the mention of the forbidden word. Aizawa's scarf wrapped around Majima's mouth a second too late. Nezu's head swiveled in Majima's direction, and his eyes grew wide and vacant. He twitched and muttered excitedly to himself as he hit the intercom button and sent out a fateful announcement. Another few keystrokes brought out the private projects Majima had laying around in storage. Those better not kill our students Majima. Aizawa hissed as he stared down at the battle droids marching against the fleeing teenagers. Relax, he said once Aizawa removed the gag. They're all programmed with the same combat protocols as the standard bots. I think. Aizawa left Majima tied up while he ran over to an emergency box and broke the glass with his elbow. He took out the electric tea kettle and a bag of gold tips imperial. Remind me again why this stuff takes 25 minutes to brew. Aizawa asked as he read the instructions. If you have any better ideas, I'm all ears, Midnight said as she tried to pull Nezu away from the panel. The principal flung her over his head and hog-tied her with her own whip. As she writhed on the floor, a ball gag inexplicably appeared in her mouth and half her clothes fell off. The remaining teachers more sensibly cowered in the corner of the room and prayed to whatever deity they thought might hear them. Aizawa gave a long-suffering sigh and turned on the kettle. Tatsuki studied the crumpled wreckage of the zero-pointer. A deep, jagged hole pierced its chest, and its lights flickered feebly. Shitty hair, Katsuki said solemnly. I may have only known you for five minutes, but you proved yourself on the battlefield today. I swear your sacrifice won't be in vain. Metal squealed, and a plate shot into the air, battered, sporting a bloody nose. And still smoking from his nitroglycerin-propelled launch, Kirishima crawled out of the wreckage with a huge grin on his face. He raised both arms high and shouted, That... Was, manly, quit standing around and find more robots to punch. Yes sir. Kirishima looked around at the smoldering wreckage lining every street. Uh, I think they ran out. 
That's what they want you to think. There's always more robots. Sneaky bastards. On cue, a section of road slid aside, and battle droids marched out. Katsuki smirked. They're bringing out the big guns for me. About time. As Katsuki hurtled towards their formation, the battle droids turned about and opened fire. Katsuki darted through the blaster bolts and tore into their front ranks. Metallic limbs flew, and heads shrieked as Katsuki yanked them off their bodies. Retreat. The droid commander called. Run away. The droids panicked and dropped their weapons. As they ran, Katsuki blasted them apart and Kirishima smashed heads and torsos with his hardened fists. In an alleyway, one droid dragged another to relative safety. The fallen droid's chest smoked from a gaping hole, and its right leg had snapped in two. With a weak cough, the fallen droid said, Leave me and save yourself, XZ-182. My capacitor's blown out. No, you can still make it. Just hold on. Tell my kid, cough, that I have positive associations with his existence. The droid's lights winked out. XZ-182 held its fallen companion and shrieked, No, come back. You still have your primary directives to carry out. Katsuki hacked his way through a wooden door with the severed head of a droid. Through the broken wood, Katsuki said maniacally, Here's Johnny. XZ-182 screamed as Katsuki blew it to smithereen. In the smoking aftermath of the battle, a tiny droid, shorter than the rest, stumbled through the wreckage until it found the remains of its designated parental unit. It picked up the droid's lifeless head and pressed it against its own, vowing revenge on the human that had massacred them all. A shadow loomed over the diminutive droid. It froze in terror and slowly looked back. Katsuki let loose a few pops of nitroglycerin and said, Whoops, looks like I missed one. The teachers stared in open confusion at the robot's disturbingly human-like antics. As one, they all looked at Power Loader. The support teacher shrugged and said, I was super drunk when I programmed those. Facing down an army of battle droids, Izuku consulted the internet for the best possible method of dealing with clankers. The internet said lightsabers and acrobatics. Seconds later, Izuku grabbed a lightsaber out of his chest and did a double front flip into the middle of the droid army's ranks. Up in the viewing deck, Cementos asked, Is that a lightsaber? What? And Ko made one too. I have to see this. Power Loader struggled against the capture scarf pinning his arms to his sides. Aizawa scowled over the electric kettle and said, You're on timeout for saying the T-word. Come on, please. I'll make sure the robots don't do anything too dangerous. They'll be fine, now sit down. At that moment, Minta flew into the window. As Minta slid down, ogling midnight before he fell off, Aizawa released Power Loader. Fine, but you better Majima leapt to the window and said, Yes, this is everything I ever wanted. Aizawa sighed and went back to the T. As Izuku hacked his way through the droids, Ida crashed through their ranks and kicked their heads off. Izuku observed the carnage he made and said, That appears far more efficient than lightsabers. The droid army, in full disarray, said, What do we do? The tactician droid smugly laughed and said, Fret not, puny droid. I have the perfect plan. It's a lightsaber speared the tactician droid from behind. As XV-287 held the dying tactician droid, it whispered, hit it until it dies. As the tactician gasped and shut off, the droid shouted, you heard him, group up and hit it until it dies. The clumps of droids fell like wheat with each swing of the lightsaber, and blasters made for poor melee weapons. As the survivors ran away, a shuddering cough stopped them. Four lightsabers sprang to life as General Grievous stalked forward. Ada backed away, and Izuku blinked at the new arrival. His mother taught him exactly how to respond. In the voice of an actor two centuries dead, Izuku said, Hello there. From the viewing deck, Majima shouted, Yes, it's everything I imagined. Come on, Grievous, I programmed your lines. General Grievous coughed again and said, Your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection. No, Power Loader shouted. Wrong line. Izuku cocked his head and said, General Grievous, you're shorter than I expected. It's all wrong. As General Grievous spun its blades, Izuku charged up his arm cannon. The shot passed perfectly through the swirling blades and burned a hole through its chest. As Grievous fell, Izuku said, so uncivilized. Well, that was anticlimactic, Majima said. Good thing I made more. At that moment, dozens of Grievouses swarmed around Izuku. As Izuku charged another shot, some Grievouses stabbed each other, some coughed and fell over, and one lopped off its own head as its lightsaber spun. Majima shook his head at the fallen Grievous robots and said, still have a lot of bugs to work out. Rainbow I think that's the last of them, Ada said. Shouldn't we check on that girl you rescued earlier? Walking over mounds of decapitated robots, Izuku and Ada passed the zero pointer and searched the rubble. The rocks floating in the air pointed them in the right direction. Almost. Uup. Got it. Achako's stomach heaved as she pressed her hand against another rock. It wobbled in the air. She moaned in frustration as she eyed the final piece, a brick facade four stories tall that pinned her legs to the ground. Do you require assistance? Izuku asked. Oh, thank God. 
Yes, please. Let me just before Achako could lighten the wall, Izuku flung it off her. Ada helped her up a little too fast for her stomach's comfort. Oh no, Achako said as she turned a violent shade of green. A glittering, rainbow-colored torrent gushed out of her as she vomited on the ground. Do you require medical assistance? Izuku asked. No, I'm fine. I more vomit cut her off. Most undignified. Ada shouted. Why are you vomiting in the middle of the exam? On you a. Grounds no less. It's disrespectful to all the other students here. And all those who came before us. Not to mention to mention the teachers and whoever has to clean up after you. Achako glared at him. I can't help it. My quirk your quirk is vomiting. Ida asked, examining her closely as she heaved up yet more shimmering vomit. That would explain the unique color. It's just a side effect. Analysis complete, Izuku said. Analysis suggests that you either have quirk-induced nausea or cancer. Saw blades and scalpels sprang up at the end of Izuku's hands, commencing recommended cancer treatment. Achako swallowed her next batch of vomit as the blades approached her. I'm fine, see. Please get those away from me. The blades retracted into Izuku's hands. Symptoms have stopped. Treatment successful. Please see a medical professional if remission occurs. Uh, sure. So, what was this about more robots I heard about? I haven't seen any. Ada proudly stuck out his chest. My diligent friend and I have already cleared them out. Really? Achako asked, pointing behind them. What about those? Schwarzenegger look-alike sporting leather jackets and sunglasses stomped their way through the rubble, shouting one-liners like come with me if you want to live and I'll be back in thick Austrian accents. Several had their faces torn away to reveal chrome skulls and glowing red eyes. Izuku aimed his arm cannon and stopped, power running low, switching to battery-saving mode. Izuku walked up to a Terminator, grabbed its head, and bit clean through its face. Oil gushed down Izuku's chin as he chewed and swallowed the scrap metal. As the robot staggered back, it shouted, It's not a Tuma. Achako took one look at the mauled face of the bitten Terminator and threw up again. Tank blue blaster fire rained down on Katsuki as he raced into the ranks of super battle droids, holding Kirishima in front of him like a shield. The hardened student soaked up blaster shots with a grin. Once Katsuki broke through their ranks, he blasted Kirishima away, knocking over several dozen droids with the hardened missile. Further back, battle droids riding hover tanks watched the slaughter. Any word from General Grievous? One asked. Grievous number 47 asked us to kill the Jedi. And number 86 said to raise the ray shields, whatever that means. The first droid looked through binoculars at the carnage. That looks like a Jedi to me. Prepare to engage. The tanks rumbled forward. And the guns thrummed as their shots charged up. Katsuki glanced at them and grinned. Open fire. An earth-shaking explosion erupted at Katsuki's feet. Once the dust settled, nothing but scorched earth stood before the hover tanks. We did it. The droid shouted. We actually killed a Jedi. My manufacturer is going to be so proud of me. A shadow passed over the droid. It looked up just in time to see Katsuki's grinning, ash-smeared face bearing down on it. It screamed as Katsuki blew its head off. The droid driving the tank shouted up. What's going on? Katsuki grabbed the droid and tossed it over the side. The other tanks, seeing one of their own get hijacked, turned about and aimed. Scratching his head over the controls, Katsuki slammed down on the joystick. The tank lurched forward just as the two on each side opened fire. Both tanks erupted in balls of fire, and screaming droids crawled from the wreckage, crashing through ranks of droids. Katsuki grabbed Kirishima by the shirt and hauled him inside. Drive, I've got more robots to kill. Kirishima grinned and drove the tank through every obstacle he could find, firing shots with the cannon willy-nilly and shouting, This is the manliest day of my life. In the ruins of a building, Gyro huddled down with several other unfortunate test takers as a horde of T-800 Terminators stalked through the streets. Mon Amy, this is it, Ayama said, clutching his stomach. I'm too gorgeous to die this way. Relax, Gyro scoffed. The school's not going to let us die. She pressed a jack to the ground and heard explosions and distant screaming. I think, an explosion right next to their hideout nearly deafened Gyro. Two Terminators blew apart in a plasma explosion and more got gunned down by smaller explosions. A hover tank rumbled by, crashing through another building, and stopped in front of them. Katsuki glared at them from atop his tank. Get in, losers, we're going robot hunting. D-O-P-P-E-L-G-A-N-G-R-S I can't help but notice that there's only a few kinds of robots out there. Vlad King said, I thought I'd be more impressed. Power loader scoffed. Those are just the beta prototypes. The alpha stuff is way too dangerous. I have it locked behind a password that Nezu would never guess. From Nezu's terminal, Alexa said, password accepted. What? How did he know the password was password 1? Aizawa glared at him. Really? What? It made me add a number. Unleashing my shitty co-workers, Alexa chirped. Majima blanched. No, wait. Those aren't ready, put those back. He reached for the console. Only for Nezu to suplex him into the floor without leaving his chair. A hole opened in the ground. 
A robotic duplicate of Aizawa leaned out, squinted up at the cloudy sky, and muttered, too bright outside. Where did I put my sleeping bag? I haven't had enough coffee for this. Everyone's expelled. Aizawa's eye twitched as he examined his robotic self. He turned his icy glare on Majima, who instinctively dug deeper into the floor. Majima-san, care to explain? From half a mile away, present Mike cackled at the robot. That's amazing. He nailed you perfectly. A robotic copy of his ashy waltzed out and shouted, Hey, look at me. I'm a hot shot radio host. And I'm going to sing loud enough to wake the dead while Majima's welding his robots together. Robot Aizawa glowered as Robot Hizashi sang Nickelback at full volume. Hey, present Mike squawked. I do not sound like that. And Nickelback, really? Robot Sekijiro stomped out and scowled at Robot Aizawa. This year, my students will beat yours. I better go over to Majima and demand he give all my students the best gear possible. And before Aizawa gets his, that will show him. As more and more robots marched out, more and more glares turned on Majima. The support instructor nervously chuckled and said, One of my students must have snuck in those voice prompts. Still bound up, Midnight said, Take it easy on him. It's all in good fun, right? The Midnight duplicate walked out, scantily clad in a bunny-eared playgirl costume and flaunting its well-crafted cleavage. Yoo-hoo, Majima honey, where are you? Mommy's feeling needy tonight. The ropes fell away as Midnight stalked over to Power Loader. Sensing his imminent death, Majima crawled back in a corner and trembled. Looks like somebody's been a bad boy. Midnight cracked her whip. You need to be punished. Over in Area C, students cowered in an alleyway as Terminators and battle droids marched past. What if we surrendered? Minda whispered. Are you crazy? You saw what they did to that other guy. The scaly teen shivered. I can still hear him screaming. A teacher passed by, and Minder rushed out. Aizawa sensei, there's too many of them. What do we do? Metallic red eyes glowed balefully at them. Robot Aizawa's capture scarf grabbed Minta and slammed him through a building. You're expelled. M-E-C-H-A I think this exam is going well. Ada said as he and Izuku plowed through another shambling group of Terminators. Our enrollment should be assured. Speak for yourself, Achako said as she clutched her stomach. I'm still feeling nauseous. The ground shuddered. More holes opened, and from them lumbered steel behemoths. A grinning skull face stared down at Ida as machine gun barrels spun in its arms. I take it back. Ada shouted as he carried Achako to safety. Rubber bullets chipped the concrete in his wake. We are highly unprepared for this turn of events. Izuku leapt into the air and came crashing down on the robot's head. The mech's torso crumpled under Izuku's fist. There are stationary mechs just north of here, Izuku told them. It appears that we can pilot them. Ida took one look at the swarm of giant robots stamping through the city, some comparable to the Zero Pointer, and made a mad dash for the empty mech. In a clearing surrounded by toppled buildings, Three mechs hunched over, their boxy black cockpits open and vacant. Two had black paint jobs and handheld assault rifles, while the third sported pink colors and jagged metal claws on one arm. Ew. Achako perked up at the sight of Gurin. I call dibs on the pink one. While Achako clambered into the pink one, Ada skeptically eyed the burais. Are you sure we will be able to pilot these? Why wouldn't you? The controls are quite simple to understand. Really, I'm glad that whoever designed these had usability in mind designing their interface. Very responsible of them. The moment the hatch of the Gurren close, it spun in circles violently enough to stir up a dust cloud. Inside, Achako felt her stomach flip as she wrenched at the joysticks, quickly losing control over her stomach. Achako threw up while the Gurren spun, spewing rainbow fluids everywhere. As rainbow sludge dripped out of the hatch, Majima wailed, Don't throw up in there. I just put in the upholstery. Meanwhile, Ida frowned in confusion at the perplexing wall of buttons and dials in front of him. He gripped the two joysticks and said, Izuku said this would be simple and I should trust in my companion. This should be the throttle, right? When he inched both throttles forward, missiles fired out of the Burai's shoulders. As two matched rounded a corner, they both took missiles to the face and fell in smoking heaps. Whoops, maybe this one. A slash Harkin grabbed a building, yanking Ida forward. As he fell, he slammed into another match and crushed it beneath him. I have to get back up. Maybe this button would help. Rocket sprang to life on his legs, plowing the fallen mech forward. He hit two more mechs along the way and ground them to scrap. As Ida crashed into a building and brought it down on yet more mechs, Majima smiled in approval. I'm impressed he knows how to pilot that. We're screwed, Jiru said as Kirishima rammed the tank into a giant robot. We are so screwed. The robot grabbed the tank on either side and tore it in half like a plastic bag. Jiru and the other students on board tumbled out like fruit snacks. Bakugo launched himself through the air and blew a hole through the robot's torso like a very angry jalapeno wasabi fruit snack. Screw you, I was still using that. Hiroshima shouted at the smoldering remains. Of oh, guys, Jiro asked. Now what? What do you mean now what? Bakugo asked. 
He pointed at a throng of giant robots. We fight them, of course. On foot. Ciro asked. We'll be crushed. Literally. Gyro plugged her amp into the ground. Thanks to the magic of sound waves and plot convenience, she found a horde of humanoid robots just around the corner, painted in variations of red, white, and blue patterns. Each had guns or swords crossed behind their backs. Sweet, Ciro said. We can use the match to destroy the matches. Bakugo walked up to one and blew it to smithereens. As he went to the next one, Ciro held him back with a roll of tape. What the heck, man? We can use those. Bakugo pressed his face into Ciro's and gave him a deranged, wide-eyed stare. That's what they want you to think. They make things easy at first. Then you get complacent, and that's when they get you. Well, it's that or get crushed by giant robots. I think I'll take my chances. Ciro hopped in one, and the hatch slammed shut. Seconds later, every part on the robot vibrated violently. It collapsed into a heap with Ciro still clutching the twin joysticks, head rattling from the vibrations. Guess I picked a lemon, he said shakily. That Hugo, grinning, gestured to the next and said, Go right ahead, try another. Maybe then you'll see I'm right. You know, I wasn't going to, but now I will, just to prove you wrong. Ciro examined the next one and gave it a cautious tap. Assured of its structural integrity, Ciro hopped in. After it closed, smoke poured out of every crevice of the mesh. The hatch flew open, and Ciro staggered out, covered head to toe in soot and missing an eyebrow. Nope, I've had enough. Let's just move on. Ciro took one step before a tremor shook the ground. Off in the distance, a behemoth raised its head over the rooftops and scanned the area. Swallowing nervously, Ciro ran for the largest robot of the bunch, said a quick prayer, and hopped inside. Moments later, it flew apart in a fiery explosion, for once not of Katsuki's doing. Hair splayed back and slightly charred on the front, Ciro stared out from the crumpled heap of his cockpit. He wrapped his tape around another robot and toppled it. Nope, I'm done. Destroy them all. Back Hugo grinned. Gladly, recharged Purple Sutherlands darted around the corner, guns blazing. Glory to Britannia. They shouted, surrender filthy elevens, and we might spare your pathetic lives. Izuku drew a superheated metal blade, its length shimmering with an orange glow, zipping through gunfire. Izuku slashed through four Sutherlands, detonating their fuel reserves. Off to the side, Achako batted aside three lances and slashed their wielders to scraps while she spun. And Ida took out two by falling on his back as two Sutherlands charged from both sides, impaling themselves on the other's lance. The Lancelot, more imposing than its smaller brethren, drew a shimmering green blade and met Izuku head-on. As their blades clashed, a foot crushed the Lancelot flat. The owner of the foot, a red and black monstrosity with a huge grinning face, took off its shades and batted Izuku aside with them. His mech fell apart as he landed inside a building. Kaminari stared in shock at Izuku as he clambered out of the wreckage. Dude, you can pilot those things. Izuku looked back at the mangled wreckage of his burai. This one can no longer be piloted. I recommend finding an alternative means of destroying robots. Uh, right. Ida and Achako both landed inside the building. Achako groaned as she flopped to the ground and said, Ugh, I can feel the earth spinning. You seem to be suffering from severe motion sickness, or you have cancer. Preparing surgical equipment. Achako sprang to her feet. I'm fine. The Gurren tore off the roof and grinned down at them. Achako swallowed and said, I'm less fine now. Kaminari smirked. Don't worry, I'll send this one packing. 10 million volt highly discriminate shock. In true discriminatory fashion, the electricity spewed homophobic slurs as it shot at the Gurren. However, the electricity curved around and struck Izuku instead. Uh, oops. Izuku audibly hummed as his battery accepted the overloaded power. Charge complete. Returning to high performance mode. Green charged plasma burst through the Gurren's torso, coming out the other side in a spiral shape. Sato glanced up at the collapsing mech and back at the student that put a hole in it and asked, Mind if I come with you guys? What? No, I'll be fine by myself, Kaminari said. His voice slurred. Those robots won't know what hit them. A Terminator dropkicked him from across the room. It had both hands around Kaminari's throat before Izuku sliced it in half with his lightsaber. Panting hard and given a thorough vibe check, Kaminari wizened up and said, On second thought, I don't mind giving you a hand. Bigger is that tea almost done. Present Mike shouted from a mile away. Feels like this test's been going on for four weeks. Yeah, hurry up on that. Power loader chimed in. I think I'm running out of robots. How are you running out of robots? You've got Borg and Cybermen out there. Aren't those the same thing? They're not, you Philistine. One's a cybernetic hive mind that incorporates any organics they run across in Star Trek. And the other is a cybernetic hive mind that incorporates any organics they run across in Doctor Who. Enough, you two, Aizawa snapped. Five more minutes on the tea. Then we get to clean up this mess. Nezu, having heard that, stopped sending orders to the army of robots at his fingertips and called up the big boys. 
Off in test area C, which lacked a walking weapon of mass destruction or a walking weapon of mass destruction with attitude problems, Koda and Minda huddled together in a cramped hollow beneath a toppled building with a group of terrified, generic students. Just outside their meager shelter, a swarm of Daleks floated past, shouting exterminate in tinny voices as they fired lasers at some poor victim. Cybermen stomped past, stopping to peer into the abode as the students all scurried behind rocks before moving on. Dude, are those flying trash cans? I bet we could take those. You bet we could take the battle droids. And look where we ended up, another student snapped, who sported blaster burns on his back. Just shut up and hope we don't get caught. Should we make a break for it? One whispered. Are you kidding? Minda asked. Last time we tried, this human-looking robot yeeted me into a wall. I'm still picking masonry out of my hair. He pulled a brick out from behind his ear and said, See, Koda wished he had an animal to talk to. Of course, they all had the sense to flee the area the moment robots from every major franchise opened fire in the street. A rumble in the ground silenced the students. The earth groaned as the largest opening yet slid open in their mock city. From the gaping abyss, a robotic leviathan, shaped like a bipedal dinosaur, lumbered onto the streets, shattering concrete and shaking the ground with each step. As it loomed over the ruined edifices around it, Mechagodzilla let out an ear-splitting roar that shattered every pane of glass around it, as one wall gave out from the quakes, exposing the students both to the giant robot dinosaur and the assembled armies milling about the streets. Minda fell to his knees, crying as he wailed, I want to go home. The Cyberman that threw Minda half a mile didn't quite have the upper arm strength to oblige his request, but at least it made the effort. Jet fuel can't melt steel beams, Kaminari said woozily from Izuku's back. Sparks ran along Izuku's body as he fired a laser beam through a battalion of Robocops. Is he okay? Achako asked. It's his quirk, apparently, Sato said. He gets stupider as he uses it. The moon landing was a hoax, Kaminari shouted. Bender bending Rodriguez leapt out of alley and swung at Ada. Laughing, the robot bent over and said, Bite my shiny metal ass. Okay. Izuku chomped a hole in the metal. Bender looked at the damage, said my programming isn't designed for this shit, and unscrewed his own head. The earth is flat. I don't see it curving underneath our feet. Can you? Warning, low battery, Izuku said, looking back at Kaminari. I estimate I have two minutes of runtime until Kaminari sends IQ hits the single digits. COVID isn't real. It's a hoax invented by Bill Gates to put microchips in the vaccines. Achako shuddered. If that's what he's saying now, I don't want to know how much stupider he can get. The ground shook. Three robotic, serpentine heads slithered from the depths of UA, each scanning their surroundings and firing plasma beams at anything that moved. Izuku pinched Kaminari, shocking him into shocking Izuku until he had no charge left. Kaminari dropped to the ground with a dopey grin, giving the sky a thumbs up and mumbling. Aliens made the pyramids. I've analyzed the specs of the Mecha Hydra, Izuku said, pointing at the giant robot. Each head has a distinct computer, and the entire structure is designed to build two heads for each one that's destroyed. The only way to disable it is to simultaneously destroy all three computers located in different spots in each head. Excellent work, Midoriya. Ida said. Did you use your quirk-enhanced senses to deduce all that? No, I consulted the internet. Majima Sen made a Facebook post three days ago at 2.03 am with full schematics and combat data for this robot. Even cleverer. Excellent researching. I was right to hold you in such high regard. It will take all my power to fire a shot strong enough to take out all three computers. Ida, I need you to keep their attention. Understood. Achako, make me lighter. Holding back her vomit, Achako tapped him and gave a queasy thumbs up. And Sato, throw me on my signal at a 42, 6 degree angle, using 55 25, 6 newtons of force. Ew, what? Izuku blinked and adjusted his plans. Just throw me really hard. Why didn't you say so? Sato snorted a line of sugar and bulked up. Okay, here we go. Wait, I didn't say yeet. As Izuku went hurtling through the air, he made some last-second calculations, shot short bursts of plasma from his feet to course correct, and lined up the shot. As Eater raced past, all three heads turned to fire at him, giving Izuku a shot at all three heads. A brilliant green beam vaporized every head in an instant. The giant mechanical squid stared down at Katsuki with baleful red eyes. Your species shall be harvested. The cycle must continue. Yo, shitty hair, Katsuki said. You're up. Hiroshima pumped a fist and crawled inside a pipe. This day keeps getting manlier. As Bakugo prepared to light it, an extra touched the pipe and shrank it, making a tighter fit. Another welded the cracks shut, and a third padded it in with mushrooms. I am the product of the greatest engineers in galactic history, the Reaper said. Your puny weapon is no match for the might that has toppled interplanetary civilizations since the dawn of time. Can it, asshole? Katsuki lit off his largest explosion yet. Hiroshima shot out in a red blur and slammed into the bulbous frame of the Reaper. A high-pitched shriek came from the machine as it toppled to the ground. 
Katsuki saluted the toppled remains. You fought valiantly to the end, shitty hair. Your sacrifice will not be in vain. Oase looked at him in disbelief. You killed him to take down that robot. Katsuki grabbed him by the collar. He gave his life to protect humanity. It's a sacrifice any of us might need to make. Off in the horizon, Mechagodzilla roared its challenge to the heavens. The extras backed away when Katsuki turned towards them. Cowards, all of you. We go splat when we hit it, Kamori pointed out. Not like there's anyone else with a hardening quirk. Over in Area B. As Tetsutestu wriggled on the ground hogtied with droids standing guard over him, he shouted, I know I'm missing something super manly right now. Still worth a try. Katsuki muttered. Then he shrugged and said, Right, Plan B. Hugh, what's your name? You make things bigger, right? Yes, Kodai said. Katsuki pointed at the giant robot. About that big. Sure, go ahead then. Kodai blinked in surprise. Wait, you. Well, if anyone else wants to punch the dinosaur robot, everyone else backed away. Kodai tapped his chest and said, All right, but this'll give you a killer headache afterwards. Mechagodzilla stamped through the streets, feeling a touch of boredom as it sent robots and humans alike feeling for their pitiful existence. Its creator had seen fit to make it intelligent enough to understand the insignificance of the carnage beneath its feet without the means to do something worthwhile. The ground shook beneath its feet, for once of its own making. It turned and saw a giant Katsuki stamping towards it. Finally, a worthy foe, it shouted. Our battle will be legendary. When Katsuki punched at it, Mechagodzilla raised its own arm to block. The ensuing explosion ripped the entire robot apart. Once Kodai caught up, she shrunk Katsuki back down to size. Unfortunately, his head hadn't quite gotten the memo. Lying on the ground, Katsuki's SUV-sized head strained to stand on a human-sized body. Told you you'd get a headache, Kodai said. As the gold tips imperial neared completion, Aizawa put on a lab apron and safety goggles. He set a laboratory scale on a marble block, teared a volumetric cylinder, and snapped open a jar of chemically pure sugar. With a metal scupula, he tipped delicate flecks of sugar into the flask until he achieved the specific mass of sugar Nezu's tea required. Using a funnel, Aizawa poured the tea inside and used a dropper to precisely level the tea at the line. He vigorously swirled the tea until every granule of sugar had dissolved. Aizawa tipped the volumetric flask into a warmed mug and shook out every last drop. He dipped an Eppendorf pipit into a jar of cream sourced from a local dairy farm and drew up a tiny, precise dose. Once he got the tea whirling with a spoon, he dispensed the cream, which formed wispy white swirls as it blended in. Next, Aizawa changed into a black butler's uniform, decorated with white frills along the collar and cuffs. He set the tea on a silver platter and held it in one hand. His polished shoes clacked on the floor as he strode up to Nezu. Sweat beaded on his forehead as he set the down his offering, bowed, and stepped away. Seconds passed. Every teacher in the room held their breath, watching Nezu with a mixture of awe and dread. Nezu paused darted across the keyboard, and he stared wide-eyed at the screen with pupils large enough to see stars in broad daylight. Mutters about test subjects and experiments tumbled off his tongue, punctuated by the occasional maniacal cackle. Steam curled from the mug and wafted over Nezu's nose. His paws froze over the keys, nose twitching and eyes vacant. Nezu reached for the mug and held it under his nose for a moment. Hey, is that tea ready yet? Present Mike shouted from his perch half a mile away. As one, the teachers shushed him, and Present Mike whispered back, Sorry. Nezu took a sip. A warm smile spread across his face as his pupils returned to their normal size. His expression turned confused as he stared out at the carnage and destruction in front of him. Good heavens, looks like the students really went overboard this year. We'll have to lecture them on collateral damage. Every teacher let out the breath they had been holding. Aizawa glanced at the strewn wreckage of Mechagodzilla and asked, How are we going to judge points this year? The same way we always do, I imagine, Nezu said amiably, unless there was something I missed. Aizawa pointed out the window at the heaps of robots. Nezu peered out and said, Huh, did some of the prototypes get released by mistake? Ah, uh, no matter. I'm sure we'll think of something. It appears some of the students were seriously injured by the prototypes. Nezu grinned. That's what we pay recovery girl for, isn't it? Through test site B, the moans and sobs of the examinees hung over the strewn rubble and fallen robots like a fog. Students sporting concussions, blaster burns, and broken bones from the robotic assault huddled against crumbling walls, under fallen beams, anywhere offering vague protection from the looming robotic threat that had overwhelmed them all. Through that gloomy fog cut a rhythmic, clacking sound, an auditory light in the darkness. Recovery girl wove her way through the rubble, tapping her cane as she walked. Every ten steps, she stuck her cane in the ground, dug a hand into the jar of gummies she held, and popped a handful in her mouth. Still chewing on the gummies, she approached a student with a broken leg. He stared up at her with a tear-strewn face and asked, Are you a nurse? Recovery girl chuckled and said, Dearie, I'm recovery girl. I healed a man with no stomach and half a lung, and he's still kicking. 
Now, let's take a look at that leg, shall we? The student gritted his teeth and pulled up his pants. Recovery girl tutted at the swollen, purple lump below his knee. Just a smooch, and it'll be all better. This won't hurt a bit. The moment her lips caressed his bruised skin, the student screamed in agony. Flesh writhed as the bone fragments wriggled back into place and fused together. As the swelling died down, the student screamed, Just cut it off. Please, make it stop. All better. Recovery girl held out her jar of gummies and said, Here, have one. Healing like that takes a lot out of you, and these will perk you right up. Still sobbing, the student took a gummy with shaky fingers and chewed it. Within seconds, their expression turned vacant, their eyes staring out into the cosmos. A shudder ran up their spine, and their pupils grew large enough to turn their entire eyes black. The student giggled and stroked a polka dot pink giraffe that only he could see. As she strode up to the next student, whose right arm hung limp as a cooked spaghetti noodle, he gave a squeamish glance at the student currently tripping enough balls to fill every McDonald's mosh pit in the world. He said a quick prayer and asked, Can I have the gummy first? Recovery girl shrugged and held out the jar. All the same to me Sonny. Now let's fix that arm of yours. As the gummy kicked in, recovery girl kissed his broken arm. The student stared numbly at the arm as it writhed like a snake until it straightened out. He tried to bend it back over, but Recovery Girl swatted at him with a cane until he stopped. Once she drugged up and healed the students at Site B, she turned towards Saida and marched forward, scarfing down gummas as she went. The moment Izuku shot the Mecha Hydra, the force from his plasma projectile slammed him through a brick wall. The side of his face slammed on stone, wrenching his head aside. Undeterred by the damage he had taken, Izuku shoved his way out of the rubble. Ada rushed over to where Izuku had landed. To his relief, his future classmate stood and stretched his arms. Most excellently done, fellow student. Your plan was flawlessly executed, and I am honored to have been a part of it. Machako and the others arrived next. She pointed in horror at Izuku and said, Your head's backwards. Izuku looked down and saw his own backside. Ah, uh, one moment please, I shall recalibrate my next rotation. Seizing his head with both hands, Izuku wrenched his own head aside with a sickening snap. Turning back around, Izuku rolled his neck and said, Recalibration complete. Thank you for providing feedback on my hardware issue. Ida gasped and said, My word. You should have left such a grievous injury to a professional medical expert. The others covered their mouths, turning green. Achako ran aside and vomited rainbows on the ground. Kaminari, wobbling on his feet and giving everyone a vacant expression, meandered up and said, Hey guys, where'd that giant lizard go? I wanted to touch it. He noticed the rainbow puddle on the ground. Ew, what's this stuff? Before anyone could stop him, Kaminari dipped his fingers in the puddle and licked it. MMM, tastes like Skittles. Ida's mouth flapped open and shut, as if he were giving a stern lecture, but not a whisper of air left his throat. Izuku stared nonchalantly, blissfully unaware of the horror unfolding before him. The others buried their faces, too embarrassed to give Kaminari a much-needed reality check. Achako stared back and forth between Kaminari and the vomit he had just tasted. Her cheeks bulged, then she vomited another torrent of rainbows at Kaminari's feet. Kaminari looked at the vomit, then his fingers, then Achako, then back at the vomit. As fried as his brain was, it eventually gathered the disparate facts, compiled them in a semi-coherent report, and announced them before an assembly of the few functional neurons he still had rattling around his skull. Kaminari licked his fingers again, still struggling to come to terms with the reality unfolding around him. Sato sprinted away, struggling to keep down his own breakfast. Ada's face turned blue as his lungs stopped functioning. Achako gave Kaminari a bewildered stare before vomiting a second batch. This time, Kaminari's eyes widened with shock. He wiped his fingers on his shirt, backed away from the puddle, and tried to scrub his tongue with his hands. Watching the chaos unfold, Izuku asked, Should I sample some of the strange liquid as well? Ada's eyes rolled into his sockets, and he collapsed. Achako gave one last dry heave before joining him. Staring at his own hands in horror, Kaminari said, I'm never using my quirk again. As Izuku's group headed towards UAS testing facility, the rhythmic tap of recovery girl's cane caught their attention. Izuku's mechanical eyes zoomed in on the elderly hero. Shuzenji Chio, recovery girl, currently employed at UA born April 4, 2076, registered quirk heel, frequently purchases Yoroi Musha brand arthritis cream and has house and Dexter listed as favorite series on her Netflix account. Dude, Sato said. That's hella creepy. Eyeing the students, recovery girl said, looks like you're in better shape than the others. Still, can't hurt to pass around a few gummies. They'll perk you right up. Sato grinned. Gummies. Awesome. I could use a top off. He popped a handful in his mouth. After he swallowed, his whole body rippled. Muscles bulged out, ripping his clothes. With a booming laugh, Sato stomped the ground hard enough to stagger everyone around him. These gummies are amazing. 
Sato bellowed at the heavens. Time to kick Gon's ass. After Sato sprinted off in another direction, Kaminari dashed up to her and said, Me next. I'm gonna get super jacked. Kaminari took a whole mouthful and swallowed them whole. A high-pitched hum came from him as his whole body vibrated violently. Then, with the sound of a cathode TV losing power, Kaminari's eyes dimmed and the vibrating stopped. He held up one hand and wriggled his fingers in front of his face. When did I get so many fingers? Kaminari giggled. I could hold so many controllers with these. How about the rest of you? Recovery girl asked. Any injuries I should know about? Well, I am feeling a bit nauseous, Achako said. Recovery girl held out the jar. With a look of trepidation at Kaminari drooling on the ground, Achako ate one. She put her hands on her face, and her feet left off the ground. Wow, I feel amazing. Achako said. It's like I'm floating. Recovery girl turned to Ada. One for you, dearie. No thank you, madam. My parents instructed me never to accept unknown substances from strangers, and those gummas of yours seem to have highly irregular side effects for everyone taking them. I will have to request an active ingredient list and consult my primary physician before recovery girl tossed a gummy in his mouth. Ada stopped mid-rant, lowered his raised finger, and slouched his shoulders. That tastes pretty good. Thank you. You're welcome. To Izuku, she asked, any medical concerns? His head was backwards, Ada said. Broken neck. I can fix that. She pressed a kiss on Izuku's cheek. Nothing happened. Frowning, recovery girl said, I'll get the lawyer, and tapped her cane on the ground. An office rose from the rubble behind her. The lawyer seated at the desk pointed at the stack of papers in front of him and said, I'll need you to sign these waivers. After Izuku signed and photographed the pages, the office sank into the ground. Recovery girl walked off and said over her shoulder, Best of luck, kid. You'll need it. Hey power loader. Nezu asked as he stared out over heaps of robots from iconic franchises. Did you consult our legal team when you made those robots? Majima shrugged. It's not like we're making a video of this stuff, right? From his perch half a mile away. Present Mike shouted, it already has 50 million views. Nezu took a sip of his tea and said, You do realize how cutthroat Disney can be when defending their ips, right? They put a lot of work into buying out every last franchise in the world. And they'll be damned if they let anyone else play with their toys. Majima snorted. What are they going to do, sue us? The sound of footsteps, from feet beyond counting yet perfectly in sync, broke the silence. From over the horizon, countless bland-faced men in three-piece suits, each carrying a suitcase, marched in rank and file towards the Ua campus. A flag-bearer at the front bore a black mickey on a pale blue field. Oh dear, Nezu said, it looks like they're filing a cease and desist. So, we just take back the video, right? The ground shook. As the rank and file marched forward, a lumbering titan strode behind them. A hideous behemoth, covered in white plumage and wearing a blue sailor suit, its duckbill like two school buses crushed together, scouring the ground at its feet with its huge, bloodshot eyes, flattened the debris beneath its webbed feet. A thick iron collar clamped around its neck, and a team of lawyers wrangled it forward. When it saw the U, the campus, it let out a wheezing, high-pitched roar and raced forward, yanking its handlers behind it. Aizawa scowled at the massive army at U.S. gates. I do believe they intend to make sure we cease and desist breathing. Not to worry, Nezu said. I have a foolproof weapon for exactly this occasion. Nezu went over to one of the emergency glass cases marked in case of Disney and smashed it open. He took out the speech card and set up the microphone. Nezu cleared his throat and said, This work of fan fiction is a non-profit fan-based parody. My Hero Academia is owned by Shuisha, Viz Media, Shonen Jump, Studio Bones, Funimation, and Kohei Horikoshi, all subsidiaries of our great and magnanimous Disney corporate overlords. Please support the original release. As Nezu's words rang out over the campus, the lawyers ground to a halt. Each as thin as a sheet of paper, the lawyers turned sideways and disappeared. The giant Donald Duck grumbled angrily to itself as it lumbered back across the ocean. The sound of crumbling masonry filled the room, coming from everywhere and nowhere. Sounds like a wall broke, Vlad King remarked. Yes, the fourth one, Nezu said cheerfully. Just ignore it and it should be fine. Majima looked outside, confused. I'm think more than four broke out there. I said ignore it. In the rubble of a testing area, the examinees had all crowded around, shrugging off the effects of recovery girl's treatment. Sato only wore his underwear and left sock, and he sported a spectacular black eye given to him by God himself. Kaminari drooled and gave off the occasional spark, and Ida alternated between politely chatting with his neighbors and ranting about the evils of medical fraud. Nezu addressed the crowd from his nest in Aizawa's scarf. Thank you all for gathering here. Normally, we would send you all on your way and give you the results next week, but given the unusual circumstances this time around, we're trying a different approach. What were those other robots even worth? Nezu shrugged. Before we ask that, why don't we have a show of hands? Who doesn't want to enter our hero program? The students, exhausted and traumatized by the robot invasion, 
raised hands and droves. Excellent. You're all dismissed. Minta, trapped between a rock and a hard place, or in other words, Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu, struggled with tears streaming down his face to join the flock of students heading for the gate. But the hardening duo proved too solid for him to budge. Foda, too timid to raise his hand or speak out, remained nervously rooted at the spot, staring Nezu as though the principal were about to chew off his feet. Nezu did a quick head count. That leaves exactly 36 of you left. Congratulations. You're all accepted. What about our test scores? Mina asked. I'll be honest, I think I failed. Irrelevant. You always takes the top 36 applicants, with four recommended by heroes. As you're the only ones left, the points and tests don't matter. How imprudent of you. Ida cried. You stoop to accept those unworthy of U.S. lofty standards simply because they are all that remain. It's a disgrace to Ida slouched over as his voice trailed off. Actually, I don't see why it's a big deal. They're still here, so why not? Ida shook himself. Though, standards must be maintained. He shrugged. It's not like there's anyone else to pick from. Standing straighter, Ida said, then take only the finest that remain. Yua is the bastion of the hero world and must remain selective with its candidates for the sake of hero society. Recovery girl walked forward, gummy in hand. Oh dear, still seems like you're out of sorts. Here, have another one. Ida relaxed after recovery girl shoved the candy in his mouth. Nezu grinned and said, right, we'll mail you your acceptance letters. See you all in the spring. Once the students filed out, Nezu turned towards Cementos. Ishiyama-san, be sure to put the cities back the way they were, all right. We'll need them for classes tomorrow. Cementos stared at block after block of rubble and broken robots. With a heartfelt sigh, the cement hero molded new buildings from the wreckage. Bakugo grinned as he stepped into the Wana classroom. Not a sign of the robot anywhere amid all the extras. The mood in the room felt tense, and rumors of what hardships lay ahead flew around the room. After all, if the entrance exam had armies of robots, surely everything that came after had to be much worse. Dude, Baku bro, Hiroshima called out. Pull up a seat. What do you think they'll have us do first? Bench press cars. Stop a train with our bare hands. Launch us off a spring platform into a forest full of giant shadow monsters hungry for human flesh. Minta, in the next seat over, shivered violently and prayed to every female deity known to man for his salvation. Bakugo slapped his hands together, popping a small explosion between his fingers. Who cares? I can handle whatever they throw at me. Hiroshima wept manly tears at his words. So manly. I knew you were the coolest ever. We are all the coolest ever. Monoma shouted from another desk. For we are all 1A. We'll show those 1B idiots that we are the supreme class in this institution. A yellow beanbag crawled on the floor like a caterpillar. As the class stared at it in confusion, it opened, revealing an exhausted face with bloodshot eyes and a dark 5 o'clock shadow. Eight seconds. Next time, don't waste any of my time. Eight seconds for what? Jiru asked. Don't ask stupid questions either, Aizawa snapped. He pulled gym outfits out of his sleeping bag. Now, put these on and go outside. Mina picked one up with a disgusted expression. I hope you wash that sleeping bag dude. As Aizawa's eye twitched, an explosion rocked the school. Half the classroom leapt under their desks, alert for any sign of danger. Bakugo and Kirishima stood, both grinning at the prospect of danger. A muffled scraping sound came from the hallway. Jiru was the first to clap her hands over her ears. But as the sound grew louder, the rest of the class followed suit. Stay here, Aizawa said. I'll investigate. As Aizawa approached the door, it slammed open. Vlad King, with his yellow visor cracked, his red hero suit charred and still burning on one shoulder, his face blacked with soot, and all the hair on his head scorched off, stomped into the room, dragging Deku behind him. Heat curled from the arm still molded into a plasma cannon. He tossed Deku into a chair and said, Eeny, meeny, mini, mo." Vlad King pointed to each student, stopping just before the last syllable with his hand pointing at Deku. The teacher swallowed a grimace, pointed at Monoma, and grabbed him by the collar. As Momona was dragged from the room, he shouted back, 1B is better than you losers. Aizawa glared at the new arrival and said, I knew I shouldn't have given him that free transfer. Aizawa scowled at the collected students. Many of them wore the clothing with expressions of disgust. If they wanted to make it as heroes, they'd have to deal with far worse than a bit of B.O. Throw this as far as you can without leaving the circle, Aizawa said as he tossed a baseball at Midori. Lois' score gets expelled. Wait, what? Mina shouted over the general outrage of the class. How is that fair? There's six other events. It's perfectly fair. That's not the point. If I hear more complaining, it'll be two people going home. That zipped up the class immediately. Midoriya stepped into the circle and stared out at the open field. Aizawa twitched an eye at the apparent waste of time. Midoriya, will you be throwing that baseball sometime today? Calculations to maximize the distance achieved by the baseball's trajectory are still in progress. Approximately 46 hours. 48 hours. 47 hours. 69 hours. Katsuki scoffed. 
You need to give him a time limit or he'll be there all day. Aizawa inwardly groaned. Great, a special needs student, he muttered to himself. You have 60 seconds. From when? From the time I stepped into the circle. From now. Midori a bit off his own pinky. Then he swallowed the baseball hole. Seconds later, he opened his chest and pulled out a metal sphere. His hand morphed into a plasma cannon, and he put the sphere inside. A beam of brilliant green light shot out, propelling the metal-coated baseball high into the air. The high-pitched scream of plasma crackling against metal set Aizawa's teeth on edge. While the baseball soared well out of campus grounds, Midoriya charged a second shot. Aizawa couldn't even see the baseball, but he could see the plasma glance off it as the extra shot pushed it even further. As Midoriya prepared a third shot, Kaminari whispered, there's no way he's hitting it again. A third shot rang out. It vanished over the horizon. Aizawa checked his score, and it shot up even faster. Judging by the final number, it landed somewhere in Europe, preferably without killing someone. Back Hugo, you're up next. What was his score? Katsuki snarled. Focus on your own performance. Fine, I'll just send it into orbit. Katsuki worked himself into a sweat, gathered it all in his hands, and slathered the baseball with it. With a tremendous wind-up, he shouted die. A tremendous conflagration engulfed the hot-headed teen. Aizawa winced as his ears were yet again subjected to unreasonable amounts of noise. As the smoke cleared, bits of blackened baseball rained down. You're not getting another one. Katsuki grinned, like I need a pity throw. I know that had to beat Deku. Aizawa decided not to inform him that with the tracker destroyed, he didn't even get a score. Yay Urazu, you're up next. When she pulled a cannon out of her chest, Aizawa groaned and covered his ears. Aizawa had a quandary. On one hand, logic dictated that he pushes his students to their absolute limits to better understand their quirks and their mindsets. On the other hand, sunset was ten minutes ago. Most of his students had left hours ago, and Midoriya and Yeyurazu were still running laps around the school. Well, Midoriya was cruising along on treads built into his feet, while Yeyurazu rode the Segway she had made after her scooter ran out of gas, but Aizawa hardly cared about the semantics at this point. For some godforsaken reason, Kirishima and Bakugo had stayed to watch. Then the butler had shown up. Aizawa had called up Nezu to lecture him on security, but the rodent could hardly refuse one of the school's top donors. So, Aizawa sat Ramron straight, on his best behavior for the butler, unable to sleep a wink and dreading the patrol he'd have in an hour. His coffee and jelly packs had run out ages ago, and his scarf twitched with the badly suppressed urge to strangle everyone around him. Kick his ass, ponytail, Bakugo shouted. Show that robot that humanity won't take this one laying down. Don't let him win. You are doing most spectacularly, Miss Yeyurazu. The butler called out as he elegantly waved a Yeyurazu sign he had retrieved from his limo. I have the utmost faith that you will put that rapscallion of a classmate in his place. Go Midoriya, Kirishima shouted. You're the manliest ever. Bakugo whirled around. The fuck? Why are you cheering for the robot? Well, everyone else was cheering for Yeyurazu-san. It wouldn't be manly to leave Midori bro without any support. He turned back to the marathon and shouted, You're also very manly Yeyurazu. The butler gave him an affronted look. Why, good sir, Miss Yeyurazu is nothing of the kind. She is the epitome of elegance and grace and has nothing of the boorishness of man. Chillax, bro, manliness knows no gender. Yeyurazu's segue sputtered to a stop. Running off it, Yeyurazu tried to make a pair of rollerblades but they came out missing their wheels. She gave a stoic grimace and continued running, despite how thin her quirk had left her. Stepping in, Aizawa called out, Midoriya, how much longer can you keep that pace? I currently have 12 hours and 47 minutes of battery life remaining. Once the sun rises, net power consumption will drop by 86%. Think you can match that, Yeyurazu. She gave her classmate one last stubborn look before giving in. No, sensei, I'm exhausted. There's a time and a place to exceed your limits. Here, it'll do more harm than good. As Yeyurazu walked away, Bakugo stormed over. Your humanity's last hope, and you're throwing in the towel. Get back out there and win. For your information, Aizawa snapped. The marathon results don't matter. Midoriya placed first by a wide margin. When Bakugo lunged for Midoriya, Aizawa finally had his excuse to strangle someone. As the second day of class started, Jiru had an internal debate with herself. On one hand, she really didn't want to stick her hand in the hornet's nest that was whatever the heck Midoriya and Bakugo had going on. However, morbid curiosity about why there are only 20 sets of heartbeats, 19 from the students plus the erythmic, caffeine-driven stutter of Aizawa's shriveled circulatory organ, overruled her self-preservation instinct. Midoriya, weird question. That is indeed a weird question, given that you haven't asked anything. Midoriya replied. Jiru rolled her eyes. Mind if I ask why you don't have a heart? Bakugo stormed over, grinning so fiercely that Jiru felt her fight-and-flight instincts kick in. She held her squirming jacks in her hand to keep them from gouging out Bakugo's eyeballs. It's because he's a robot. 
Back Hugo roared. Finally, hard, cold evidence. Jiru jabbed him in the neck. No one asked you. Actually, I do have a heart, Midoriya said. Want to see? See? Jiru asked. See what? Izuku rolled up his shirt. Jiru felt herself sweat profusely at the sight of six-pack abs in front of her. Mina Wolf whistled and said, Damn, Midoriya, way to put on a show. The mood in the classroom took a sudden and precipitous freefall when Izuku plunged a scalpel into his chest. Achako threw up more rainbows. Takoyami muttered something about madness and darkness, and Koda's eyes rolled into the back of his head as he tipped sideways. Jiru fought back her own hysteria as Izuku peeled back the skin over his chest. Midoriya reached inside and pulled out a small boxy machine with clear tubing on either end. This is my heart. Jiru listened to it, but it didn't make a sound. Is it beating? Not currently. I only circulate blood when I need to reconstruct parts of my body, as it's what carries the components I break down, along with the nanomachines that make them in my bloodstream. See, Bakugo roared. He even has nanomachines. It's his quirk, is it not? Todoroki asked, staring at Midoriya's open chest with an apathetic expression. I don't understand the fuss. I take it that's the stomach. Jiru asked, pointing at a big boxy container. Yep, it incinerates everything inside and absorbs any remaining metals into my bloodstream. It also has thermal vents to power the battery back here, if I consume anything that can undergo an exothermic reaction. He pointed to a metal cylinder with light panels along the side, showing he had full charge, hooked up to bundles of wires running across his body. Wait, hold on, Siro asked. Is this just an elaborate way to go into detail about how your body works without making it seem forced and unnatural? The sharp crack of bricks breaking filled the room. Over the intercom, Nezu said, Cementos, the wall broke again. You know which one? From down the hall, Cementos moaned, why do I have to keep fixing it? When Aizawa announced that they would be picking their representatives, one erupted in a cacophony of shouts. Already done with existence, Aizawa put on some industrial-grade earplugs, more noise-canceling headphones over those, and buried himself so deep in his sleeping bag that it would take a spelunking crew weeks to find him. Once Ada called for a democratic vote, a full election cycle ensued. Many campaign speeches were had, hats and flags were distributed, and babies were kissed. Ida took the polls and tallied up the votes. First, we have Yeirazu as president with 18 votes. What? Bakugo roared. How did Ponytail get that many votes? Kaminari, sweating nervously, hid a hand inside his pocket. Oh, you know, she makes a very compelling argument about, um, confiscating the ill-gotten capital of the bourgeoisie and disseminating it among the proletariat. She's not a communist, you moron. She's richer than Bakugo cut off with a glance at Kaminari's bulging pockets. His hand shot inside and came out stuffed with bills. She bribed you. Uh, no. That's just my lunch money. Bakugo stalked around the room and found more wads of cash. Did you bribe the whole school ponytail? Yeirazu gave him a perplexed look. Isn't that how elections work? Ida glared down at her. My word. I can hardly believe the scandal. Bribing the constituents. It goes against the very spirit of this school. Well, either you're happy to see us, Juru said flatly, or she bribed you too. Ida, his own pockets bulging with dirty money hung his head in shame. Paragon of virtue that I am. Even I fell victim to the wiles of capitalism. For shame. Well, at least the robot didn't win, Bakugo grumbled. Last thing we need are robots in charge of the government. And for vice president, we have Midoriya with two votes. A bone-chilling silence settled over the room as Bakugo slowly turned towards Midoriya. Of course, Bakugo said slowly, his voice tinged with hysteria. That's her game, isn't it? Have the pretty rich girl be your puppet while you pull the strings from behind the scenes, and when the time's right, kill her off and take power for yourself. Well, it won't work. I've seen right through your plan, and I'll defy you and your false regime with my dying breath. Hold on, Achako said. Bakugo didn't vote for Yeirazu or Midoriya, right? Correct. It would appear there is one vote for Bakugo as well. That makes 21 votes, right? Ida looked down, flustered, at the piles of votes. Why, that can't possibly be right. I triple-checked. How could I have failed democracy so thoroughly? Takoyami's shadow snickered. The class turned as the sentient quirk held up pen and paper. I voted for Midoriya because I thought it would be funny. And it is. With a roar, Bakugo lunged for the shadow and face blended into a wall. From his office, watching the whole affair play out on camera, Nezu said, I love democracy. An hour after word of All Might's employment at Yua had reached the press, news crews from across the country rushed to Yua's gate. For blocks, the streets were packed with reporters salivating over the slightest taste of newsworthy material. Yeirazu, having caught wind of the media frenzy, invited her classmates into her limo. As her butler drove over people and cameras with reckless abandon, the students of 1A enjoyed a brunch of cured hams, expensive cheeses, and flavorful fruit preserves with toasted bread slices. Too bad Izuku isn't here with us, Achako said as she crammed as much food into her cheeks as physically possible. 
Yeah, too bad, Momo said. I couldn't get a hold of him. Miss Yeirazu, the butler said, it would be no trouble to swing by his residence. In a low voice, he added, I get to run over more reporters that way. No, no need. I imagine he has already made it to school. Indeed, you are right Yeirazu san Ada shouted. Such diligence from him. He truly is worthy of the position as vice president. He raised his glass of orange juice and said, to our class representatives, their diligence serves as an example for all of us. Moods lifted by the fine dining and spacious limo, the students echoed to the reps. Meanwhile, Izuku made his own way through the reporters, which involved a fair bit of shoving, trampling, and the odd bite taken out of cameras. Once he reached the gates, reporters latched onto his gray uniform. You're a U.S. student, right? What can you tell us about All Might? Izuku turned towards the reporters. All Might is 220 centimeters tall and weighs 255 kilograms. He has blonde hair, blue eyes, and his birthday is July 10th. Ah, uh, that's nice and all. But what about his blood type is a positive, Izuku said, droning on over their protests. He was born in Tokyo, and he went to Yua High School, though records of his other primary education aren't publicly available. Could you please just tell us he went to Harvard University, where he earned a bachelor's in accounting? He then started the All Might Agency, situated on Yokohama Street in Tokyo. Izuku's monotonous lecture droned on for hours, covering every villain he had arrested, every life he had saved, his favorite foods and beverages, and plenty other mundane facts to make eyes glaze over. By the time Izuku mentioned how All Might's quirk could be inherited and how he had lost a lung five years ago, the reporters and cameramen had all nodded off. Even the cameras and microphones had stopped recording out of sheer boredom. Once he was done, Izuku walked through the gate and arrived just in time for homeroom. It was dusk when Shigaraki finally snapped out of his stupor, walked home, and decayed a barstool in a fit of rage when he realized he had forgotten to grab a class schedule. Hirajiri sighed and warped over to get the schedule. Hey Mina-chan. Yeah, Kaminori-san. We're dead. Mina gave her partner a playful shove on the shoulder. We'll be fine. You have electricity and I have acid. We'll be awesome at this. You remember that laser thing from yesterday? Imagine that ripping this building apart. Mina blanched, an impressive feat given her pink skin. We're dead. Footsteps echoed through the building, distant at first, but growing steadily louder as the seconds passed. Sparks crackled across Kaminari's skin as he quaked in terror, while acid dripped from Mina's trembling fingers. Izuku walked into the room. Kaminari shrieked and said, One billion volt indiscriminate shock. Electricity poured out of Kaminari. Yet the high-voltage torrent passed harmlessly through Izuku and dissipated into the concrete at his feet. With a dopey expression on his face, Kaminari stumbled forward and stared woozily at Izuku. Voice slurring, Kaminari said, What are you looking at me funny for? I bet I could knock your lights out. Izuku didn't move as Kaminari threw a wobbling punch. His knuckles cracked when they slammed into Izuku's face. Staring dumbly at his crooked fingers, Kaminari said, Wow, I didn't know I could bend my fingers that way. All Might said over the intercom, I believe we should count Kaminari Shonen as out. Medical bots, please take him to recovery girl. Two robots ran in with a stretcher. One whacked Kaminari over the head with a rolling pin, and the other tried to catch him. Kaminari missed the stretcher entirely and hit the floor with a thumb. The robots shrugged, loaded him onto the stretcher, and ran out the door. Mina stood in front of the bomb and swallowed. Any chance who could take it easy on me? Izuku cocked his head. Of course, I will defeat you as swiftly as possible, so you don't have to struggle so much. Great, Mina groaned. Well then, acid attack. The moment the viscous glob of acid flew towards him, Izuku dove aside. Mina flung more and more, spattering the room with white sludge. Warning, caustic chemicals present, initiating escape plan alpha. Izuku turned around, sprinted straight through a concrete wall, and leapt out the window. Not believing her eyes, Mina ran up to the broken window and saw Izuku sprint straight through UA. As perimeter gate. Mina leapt up and cheered. Woohoo. Took out the strongest student in the class. How do you like them apples? A static hum and a sharp crackle made her turn around. A green lightsaber saw it a circle around the bomb. It fell through the floor. Minta, holding a lightsaber, grinned and tapped the bomb with his free hand. Katsuki, who hadn't taken his eyes off the fight for one moment, stared speculatively at the acid as it ate its way down to the foundations of the building. Then he burst out into maniacal cackling. Ah, uh, All Might Sensei, Siro said. I think something's wrong with him. Give me some acid, raccoon eyes. Katsuki shouted as he chased Mina around the classroom. What do I look like, a cow? Get that bucket away from me. Um, Bakugo-san, Yeyurazu said. I don't think it's very safe storing a strong acid in metal. There's a high chance it would cause a reaction. That's the point, ponytail. The second the door opened, Mina and Bakugo bolted for their seats. The bucket Bakugo had been carrying rattled around as it settled on Koda's head. And yet, the stony-faced teen sat stock still, hoping the teacher wouldn't notice him if he didn't move. 
Your CQC was atrocious yesterday. Aizawa snapped. Get geared up. You'll be running hand-to-hand -hand drills for the next two hours. Everyone rushed for the door. Koda, bucket still on his head, rushed straight into a wall before fumbling his way after everyone else. When the classroom was finally empty, Aizawa muttered to himself and crawled back in his sleeping bag. Under ectoplasm's watchful eye, the class paired up. Bakugo made a beeline for Mina. Mina blocked a punch. I'm not giving you any acid. It's for the fate of humanity. I'm not letting you prank Midoriya. My acid's too dangerous for that. Who said anything about a prank? Bakugo swept Mina's legs out from under her and pinned her to the floor. He grabbed an arm and stroked along the wrist. What the, are you trying to milk my arms? There has to be a way to get it out. Bakugo muttered, maybe like this. He bent her wrist backwards, just enough to make Mina wince. Twisting underneath him, Mina freed an arm and socked him in the nose. The thith and ofer, Katsuki said, cradling his bleeding nose as he went to recovery girl's office. At the end of the day, as Mina walked out of the school, a figure wearing a giant green mask shouted Uga Booga. Mina shrieked and instinctively threw acid at the figure. As the acid ate through the mask, Katsuki scooped some into a jar. Yes, Katsuki shouted, holding the jar over his head. At long last, I can finally rid the world of the robot menace. Victory is mine. Katsuki cackled maniacally and ran down the street, shouting, I've got a jar of acid, guess what's inside it? Mina stared after him, thought about warning him that even glass couldn't hold her acid, then shrugged and went on her merry way. That night, fearing the robots would take his secret weapon away from him, Katsuki slept with the jar cradled in his arms. He woke the next morning to the smell of burnt fabric. The jar had a hole in the bottom. The acid had not only eaten through his bed, but also the floor, the kitchen counter downstairs, the water heater, one of all for one's safe houses stashed away underground, and another three miles of bedrock. As he stared down the hole, his mother stared up at him and shouted, Katsuki, USJ, USJ. The students of Wana chanted, I can't believe we're going to Universal Studios Japan. Thirteen gave Aizawa a sidelong look as they watched students cram into the bus. You didn't tell them where we're actually going. They leapt to their own conclusions. It felt illogical to waste time correcting them when they would see the truth soon enough. Thirteen shuddered. Boy am I glad you weren't teaching when I was in high school. The bus lurched sideways when Midoriya stepped inside. The wheels bounced up and down with each step he took. How much does he weigh? Thirteen asked. I suspect it varies based on comedic value. Aizawa deadpan. As Thirteen pulled the bus out of the parking lot, an ear-wrenching shriek came from the back bumper. Jiru squeezed Ajiro's tail around her ears until Momo handed her a pair of noise-canceling headphones. With his scarf wrapped around his ears, Aizawa investigated the source of the noise. Midoriya sat at the very back of the bus. Every time Thirteen hit the gas, a shower of sparks came up through the back window. Midoriya, move up a few seats. The back bumper lifted off the ground, and the sparks stopped. The moment he sat down, next to the window, the bus sagged to the side. Caught off balance by the bus's shifting weight, Shoji and Sato tumbled to the right. The bus pitched sideways, and more students fell towards Midoriya's side. Everyone, left side of the bus. Aizawa shouted as he threw himself towards the slowly rising side. Kirishima hardened up and threw himself halfway out a window, and Minda stuck himself to the side with his hair balls. Unfortunately, Izuku also went over to the left side of the bus. The left wheels slammed onto pavement, and the right ones rose into the air. Thirteen clung desperately to the wheel as gravity tried to pull her out of her seat. Aizawa pulled himself to the right side with his scarf. Asui grappled forward with her tongue, and Achako floated around the bus like an anti-gravity pinball, holding back a fresh batch of rainbow vomit. Over the commotion, Aizawa shouted, Midoriya, stand exactly in the center of the bus. The left wheels touched down as Izuku stood in the aisle. The bus rode ludicrously close to the ground, but no scraping sounds plagued them. The class breathed a collective sigh of relief as the bus finally stabilized. Midoriya, mind explaining why you're so heavy? I ate a big breakfast this morning, so I would have more material for the unforeseen simulation joint. Wait, that's what USJ means? Kaminari shouted in despair. As moans of anguish echoed through the bus, a loud groaning sound silenced them all. Two sharp snaps, in rapid succession, came from the front and back of the bus. The entire chassis lurched down, and four tires rolled away on the road. Over at the USJ, Shigaraki scowled at his watch. Stupid loading times. What is this, a PS4? You're late, Shigaraki said the moment everyone showed up. And All Might's not here. All respect to the programmers, but whoever coded your NPC behavior should be fired. Who are you? Aizawa barked. And why are you here? I had this whole villain monologue thing planned out, but we're behind schedule. Kurajiri, do the thing. What thing? Kurajiri asked. Shigaraki glared at him. We went over this. Just make the portals already. Understood sir. A portal appeared under Shigaraki's feet. As he fell through, he shouted wrong lever. Always wanted to do that, Kirijiri mused. He looked up at the heroes and said, right, you're still here. 
Let's fix that. Holes opened underneath everyone's feet. Ida sprinted away in time. While Achako floated herself away and Siro latched onto her with his tape, most everyone else, including Izuku, fell through. A ship appeared underneath Izuku. He plummeted through the deck, past the engine block, and straight through the hull, ripping through the metal-like tissue paper. As he sank towards the bottom, a shark-faced villain darted towards him. Suyu frantically swam after him, but the villain reached him first. The villain took bit into his torso. All his teeth snapped off, and a trail of red marked the fleeing villain's path. Suyu tried to pull Izuku, but Izuku proved far too heavy for her to move. As her oxygen ran out, Suyu swam up to the rapidly sinking deck of the enormous. Mina frantically tried to patch the hull with his balls, but the water pressure kept pushing them away. Seeing villains closing in and the boat sinking, Suyu picked up a stray violin and started playing. Minda looked up and shouted, What do you think this is, the Titanic? Well, what else can we do? At least let me draw you like one of those French girls. Suyu slapped him with her tongue. I don't like the French. They ate one of my cousins. The ship tilted to the side. Minda shrieked and clutched at Suyu, only to come away covered in mucus when Suyu wriggled out of his grasp. Crunching sounds came from the bottom of the ship, and the ship sank even faster. The villains are coming. We're doomed. Yeah, probably. Why are you so calm? I'm about to die a virgin. The deck vanished beneath the water. Once they sank up to their knees, however, the sinking stopped. The deck rose, now green in color, and Izuku's face looked out from the prow of a brand new ship. I am a boat now, Izuku said. That's nice. Could you get us back to dry land? The villains, hearing all this, shouted, they're getting away. Stop them. They rushed towards the back of the boat. The back of the boat rushed towards them. Villains shrieked as the stern smacked them into the air. Oops, Izuku said. Installed the engine throttle backwards. You're all the short ones now. Minda shouted down from the cockpit in Izuku's chest as he piloted Izuku's giant body through the throngs of villains. Not so funny now, is it? Suyu and Ajiro sat in front of a hedgerow and watched the carnage. Ajiro asked, why is Minda piloting Izuku's body? He was the only one small enough to fit. Let me rephrase that. Why is Izuku a giant mecha with Minda in his chest? Off in the distance, Minda said, I wonder what this button does. One of Izuku's arms crackled with electricity. The villain's shrieks nearly drowned out Minta's maniacal cackling and shouting of unlimited power. Well, Suyu said, once Izuku landed on the beach, we saw that Aizawa-sensei needed help taking out the villains. I didn't know that boat in the flood zone worked. Izuku was the boat. Anjiro gawked at Izuku for a second. Izuku's shoulders opened, and a volley of rockets flew around him. Villains went flying like bowling pins. Right, Anjiro said. That's a thing Izuku's quirk does. Why was he a boat? Suyu gave him a deadpan stare that spoke volumes of her apathy towards the continuing chaos. He crashed through the boat, ate it, and became the boat. So, we thought about how we could help Aizawa-sensei. Minta said Izuku could do it. Izuku said he couldn't harm anyone, since it went against his prime directives. At Ajiro's puzzled expression, she added, his words, not mine. Right. So, he can't harm villains, but he can allow them to come to harm. How does that work? Suyu shrugged. I read Asimov. A brilliant green flash cut across the landscape. Villains and debris went flying as a plasma beam cut a long furrow into the ground. Ajiro opened his mouth, then promptly shut it. Instead, he asked, Does Minda have complete control over Izuku? I would assume so, why? I don't think that's a good idea. The robot stopped in its tracks. Minda shouted at Izuku, Hey, let me get a closer look. Just a little nudge on her skirt, and we'll have the perfect view. Izuku didn't budge. Protocol 2, uphold the mission. Our mission is to aid Aizawa-sensei. Not acquire additional visual data on the villains. Protocol 1 was linked with the pilot, Suyu told Anjiro. Shigaraki finally tired of watching his cannon fodder get stomped on by a height-challenged teenager. A purple blur punched Izuku in the chest and sent him flying. Izuku staggered to his feet, chassis of insufficient strength to deter current threat. Initiating Protocol 3, protect the pilot. Izuku wrenched his chest open, grabbed Minta and hurled him towards the entrance. The Namu grabbed both of Izuku's arms and pulled. The steel chassis tore in two, and Izuku's smaller body fell out of the mech's spine. Lying between Ajiro and Tsuyu in a pool of his own blood, Aizawa asked, Can you please take me to the hospital? SSH, Ajiro said, The boss fight starting. Sir, you are currently breaking the law. Izuku told the hulking monstrosity as it clawed at his head. I must ask you to hand yourself into the nearest local authorities. RRAGH. The Namu shrieked as it lunged again. Izuku blocked the next swipe with his forearm. Said forearm bent at a sharp angle from the force of the blow. Within seconds, the nanomachines in Izuku's body straightened and repaired the limb. Attempts at negotiation have failed. Attempting nonviolent pacification measures. The Namu threw another punch. Despite being a fraction of the monster's size, Izuku grabbed its wrist and slammed it to the ground with a perfect judo throw. Pouncing on the monster's back, 
Izuku pinned both arms into place. Pacification complete. Contacting local authorities. Izuku's head emitted a ringtone. Error. Communications cut. Please hold while an alternate directive is devised. The Namu did not appreciate being put on hold. With a shriek, it bucked and threw Izuku off its back. It grabbed one of his legs, slammed him into the concrete a few times, and threw him. Izuku shook concrete gravel off his back, restraining measures ineffective, attempting knockout. As the Namu charged, Izuku widened his stance. Izuku sidestepped a blow and slammed his fist into the Namu's jaw. The blow didn't even phase the monster. A scrub like you doesn't stand a chance against Namu. Shigaraki jeered from the sidelines. Its shock absorption quirk gives it physical damage immunity. Understood, Izuku said. Knockout impossible. Now attempting temporary incapacitation. Izuku drew a lightsaber and slashed through the tendons in the Namu's legs. Flesh bubbled out of the charred wounds and healed the damage. Shigaraki's grin widened. Health recovery as well, from the region quirk. It's the perfect weapon to kill all might. Query, Izuku said. Villain has multiple quirks. It was made that way, Shigaraki answered. Villains, after all, had a contract obligation to explain their villainous plots and devices. Understood. Reclassifying threat to biological weapon. Lethal force authorized. Izuku leapt as the Namu punched down. Concrete burst in chunks around the monster's fist. Izuku leapt nimbly on the monster's shoulder and swept his lightsaber through the Namu's neck. The Namu knelt as its head thumped onto the shattered concrete. Izuku walked towards Shigaraki, lightsaber thrumming at his side. Come quietly, or there will be trouble. Namu stood. A new head sprouted from the stump between its shoulders. Before Izuku could turn, the Namu grabbed Izuku's head, twisted, and yanked it off his shoulders. Izuku's body crumpled to the ground. Izuku, Suyu bolted to her feet, but Anjiro held her back. Well, that was fun. Which kid should we kill next? Izuku's hand glowed. The headless body lumbered clumsily to its feet. It twisted its arm around until it was pointed at the Namu, and a brilliant beam of plasma engulfed the monster. The smoldering feet and ankles the Namu's only remains didn't regenerate. Izuku's body, out of power, fell once more as the USJ doors slammed open. Yeyarazu landed on a sofa placed inexplicably on top of a mountain. Five villains leered at her from behind. Five villains ran away screaming when Yeyarazu drew a rocket launcher out of her cleavage. Flames towered around Todoroki as he took in his surroundings. The villains smirked as they closed in around him, no doubt believing that the flames made his ice weaker when in fact they made it stronger. This is fine, Todoroki said. With a wave of his hand, the ground, the villains, and the flames themselves froze solid. Surrounded by villains, Sato snorted a tube of sugar. Muscles rippled, and his eyes took on a manic, bloodshot gleam. Woo, say hello to my little friend. Hi, I'm Kirishima, Kirishima said as Sato raised him over his head. Villains scurried as Sato played whack-a-mole. While Shoji surveyed his surroundings, a villain ran up from behind and severed one of his limbs. Shoji stared at the bleeding stump. Oh no, he said in a deadpan. Anyways, from the stump, two arms grew out, grabbed the villain, and bent him into a pretzel. A villain stared wistfully at a butterfly as it floated towards his hand. Is this a weapon? His partner cuffed him upside the head. Don't be stupid, that's a butterfly. The butterfly morphed into a club and bludgeoned them both over the head. Koda came out from behind a rock and thanked the club with butterfly wings for using its quirk to help him. Mina shrieked and flung acid behind her. A villain scrambled away, screaming, my eyes. He tripped and smashed his knee on a rock. My leg. To demonstrate the power of my tape, Siro said, standing over a villain, I saw this boat in half. What boat? The villain cried. The boat I would have if you guys dumped me in the flood zone. But no, you had to put me with a bunch of crumbling buildings. So instead, I'll cut you in half. You're about the right size for a boat. That's really hurtful, the chubby villain said, sobbing. Using a second villain, Siro cut the first in half, then stuck them back together with his tape. Aside from the occasional eye twitch and loss of feeling in their left arm, they were good as new. Bakugo stomped on a villain's head, knocking out his front teeth and making an orthodontist ten miles away sob hysterically. He glanced around the room, admiring the other villains strewn about in various states of physical impairment and seeking another victim. Any villains nearby better come fight me. I'll go easy on you. A chameleon villain, who had watched his friends beaten to a pulp, broke out in a cold sweat. They only made it halfway to the door before Bakugo locked eyes with him. Explosions rippled in Bakugo's hands as he strode forward. So, you have chosen death. The villain's screams echoed through the ruined zone. The moment All Might appeared, his face warped into a visage of murderous rage at the sight of his headless successor, Kirijiri promptly noped the heck out of there and took Shigaraki with him, with all opportunities to vent his fury gone. All Might punched the earth hard enough to register on seismographs across the world. I knew I shouldn't have stopped to help hold that man's ladder while he painted his front porch. Seriously, Aizawa said weakly as he continued to bleed out. That's why you were late. 
It was a very big porch. Katsuki strode nonchalantly past the mountains of unconscious villains and charred Namu feet. He picked up Izuku's head by its twisted metal stump of a neck and said, Alas, poor Deku. I knew him. All Might, a machine of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. What are you doing? All Might asked, staring numbly at him, quoting Hamlet. What, you think I don't read or something? All Might's temper snapped. Your classmate's dead and you're making jokes. Izuku's eyes flickered to life. I'm not dead. All Might gaped at him. What? Nothing, Katsuki said. Just ignore it. Boo, are you doing a Monty Python bit too? Izuku asked. Well, now that you ruined it, Katsuki muttered. Wait, All Might asked. He's not dead. Of course not, Katsuki scoffed. He's a robot. His mom will put him back together by tomorrow morning. Believe me, I tried. Oh, should I take him back home then? Nah, she'll come pick him up anyways. A literal light bulb. Helpfully supplied by Yeyarazu's cleavage, popped over Katsuki's head. Actually, you should bring him home. Maybe that way, you'll see the truth as well. All Might decided not to question the maniacal gleam in Katsuki's eye and scooped his broken protege into his arms. One sprint across the city later, he wound up on Enko's front step and burst into a cloud of steam the moment he stepped inside. So, All Might asked, is Izuku going to be alright? Bakugo mentioned you could fix him. It's his quirk, Enko said without a trace of hesitation. His body will regenerate if supplied with enough materials to work with. Back when Izuku was seven, he got in a nasty accident. They never did find both his arms. He was right as rain the next day. Oh, All Might said with a chuckle. The way Katsuki said it, he made it sound like Izuku was a robot. I almost believed him, what with the talking head and all that. Phew, of course it's a quirk. All right, I better get back to the school. The door bolted itself shut. Darkness loomed in the kitchen as Inko sat at the table and poured herself a cup of tea. Actually, Inko said, before you go, would you mind explaining how you let my son get injured to such a degree? All for one promptly got bumped down to third scariest person in Tashinori's opinion. Inko Midoriya checked the circuits of the new arm she had put together. Satisfied that she had welded the circuits correctly, she lined up the hollow appendage with the socket in Izuku's shoulder and clamped it on. The polymer skin swelled as nanofluid filled it. After giving the new body a once-over, Inko tapped a button on her computer. Izuku's eyelids fluttered open, and he sat up. I am home, Izuku said as he examined the workshop. Prototype weapons and circuit components adorned the workbenches. A large screen brought up blueprints for Izuku's new arm. Good morning Izuku. How do you feel? Izuku flexed his new arms and legs. Fully functional. These are a new design. I couldn't make you any stronger, so I made you faster instead. It's the best I could do if you'll be fighting villains like the Namo. Izuku stood up and stretched his legs, working his way up, rotating his hips, flexing his shoulders, twisting his back, and curling his arms. Izuku calibrated his new body. No faults detected. Everything is fully operational. Good. Are you hungry? My battery is still low. Breakfast would help replenish it. Inko checked the camera before opening her workshop door. Ever since the incident seven years ago, she made sure no one saw inside her workshop. Bolts clacked open, and the door swung outward with ponderous creaking. While Inko rinsed the rice, Izuku chopped the vegetables. His knife rapidly sliced mushrooms and leeks into thin slivers. Izuku cracked the eggs, and Inko beat them over the stovetop's flame. With a flick of her wrist, Inko tossed the two omelets onto beds of rice. Izuku filled a bottle with spicy mayo and made even zigzags over the fluffy omelets. As they bit into the omelets at the kitchen table, Inko asked, How is it? Izuku swallowed and wiped his mouth with a napkin. The omelets are of optimal fluffiness, the rice has the correct texture, and the spices are in their proper ratios. I'm glad you like them. Halfway through breakfast, Izuku set his fork down. Hey mom, what would happen if the core processors in my head were damaged beyond repair? Inko felt herself caught flat-footed by the question. She debated telling him about the backup servers in the basement. Why do you ask? The Namu had sufficient strength to crush my processors. Before that, I had not considered the possibility that I could suffer enough damage to render my mental processes non-functional. I had failed my directive as a hero. Had All Might not arrived, Inko reached across the table and touched Izuku's hand. Sweetie, do you still want to be a hero? Izuku looked into her eyes. I do not want Kaken or my other classmates to become non-functional. I will become a better hero. Inko left her seat and gave her son a hug. Then I'll make sure you have whatever you need to be the best hero there is. 